pretty for prime time on the FAA side than it is on the airplane side. Uh, I have ADSB out and in in my own personal plane. I can tell you it works fine for me in the plane. Uh, it works really, really well. It does everything it's supposed to do and very well. Um, how well it works for ATC compared to how well it might work, well, that's a whole other story. Bottom line is it's here, it's now, and you need to understand it. So uh, we'll talk about what it is, why we might want to use it, the difference between out and in, uh, when it's going to be required. There's a mandate coming up in 2020, and so we'll talk about that mandate. Uh, and if you want to comply, what do you have to do to comply? And then what are the benefits of in and out? We'll talk about portable receivers. And in fact, I've got one right here, right now going. And I've got an iPad over here, and this will do the keep a camera arm, and so I'll give a live demonstration of a portable receiver. Okay. And we'll finish up with some questions. Okay, so what is ADSB? Uh, well, it stands for, you can get it all out in one fell swoop, Automated Dependence Surveillance Broadcast. Now, that doesn't help very much at all. It doesn't really mean a lot. But if you break it down and you think about it, the automated part means no pilot input required. It just puts stuff out. In a sense, you can think of it kind of like a transponder in 1200. You just turn it on and it goes and that's the end of it. You don't have to do anything. It's even more automated than that, though. You don't have to squawk 1200. It's just transmitting. You don't know, turn it on. Generally, it's wired into your avionics bus. It's on all the time. It's automated. No pilot input. Dependent. What's it dependent upon? It's dependent upon the GPS in the aircraft. It has to have some sort of GPS source. And it has to be a WASP-enabled source. So if you've already got, for example, a Garmin 430 or 530 that's a WAS-enabled source, you can tie the output of that GPS into your out device, and that would certainly comply. You can also buy devices that have a built-in, kind of a blind GPS built into the device, right? So there's lots of ways that you can comply with the dependent part, but the bottom line is you need to have a GPS source for the data that's going out. Okay, you've already confused me. I'm really confused about this whole thing. All right. We're talking about in and out. Yes. You're talking about out. When I'm talking about dependent, yes, I'm talking about out. Okay, because in is simply this unit that sits on your glare shield. Well, it could be this unit. There's lots of... Well, this like is a portable. There's built-in units as well. Okay. Okay, so you're talking about out, not in. On the dependent side, yes, I'm talking about the out portion. So ADSB, Automated Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, the dependent part is if the out part is dependent upon the fact that when you are transmitting your position to the world, and it's not just ATC to whom you're uh, transmitting, you're transmitting to the world, uh, that output that you have needs to have a position, and it gets that position from a WAS-enabled GPS, and it must be WAS-enabled. Surveillance. It provides radar-like surveillance. And we'll talk a little bit later about mm -hmm. precisely what this is, but it basically gives your position to ATC and to other aircraft. Uh, and so the surveillance part is the radar-like surveillance if you're transmitting your position. And broadcast it broadcasts that information both to ground stations and to other aircraft. And I've heard it pronounced both ways. It's like so many acronyms. People just come up with whatever they want to say. You know, we've got a <laughs> fix on the approach here to Rehillview Ekyon. Most people pronounce that Ekyon. But uh, down at South County, there's a fix. Uh, and I've heard that pronounced four or five ways. It's AST, AC, AST. So you can pronounce this as, as you would like. The most common ways I've heard are people say either A, B, S, B, they just say the letters out, and I've also heard other people say ADS, B. So there's no common way to do it, but it's either way of the, the way of people pronounce it. Okay, what is it? Okay, if you are a ADSB equipped aircraft, and this is ADSB out equipped, that means you are continuously broadcasting your position, your altitude, 
and your identification. As we'll see when I get the uh, portable unit showing you here, um, you broadcast your tail number to the world. Right? Uh, so you'll be able to see other aircraft and see them by tail number. How is that different from a transponder? A transponder is, think about how a transponder works. You've got a ground-based radar station, and he sends a signal up from the ground-based radar. It bounces off the aircraft and comes back. Well, the little bit of radar that comes back is not very strong, so we have a transponder that sees you're being scanned and sends back a nice strong signal and is received by the radar station. This doesn't require an interrogation from the ground. It's continuously sending out the data. It says where you are, longitude, latitude, and altitude, and speed. I think there's a direction in the vector as well. I'm not sure about direction, but certainly uh, position and altitude and ID get transmitted out. But it's just continually going out, whether you're being scanned by anybody or not. So that's the big difference, right, is that it's automated and it's continuous. As opposed to, if I had a transponder and I was flying over Nevada at low level and I wasn't being scanned by radar, my transponder never replies. The reply light would never go on. If I'm flying over the Nevada desert and there's no radar, no nothing, no ADSB ground stations, I'm still continuously transmitting my position. The transponder by its design doesn't have as good uh, accuracy as flocks when able to Well, it's not so much that the transponder, you're, you're right. No, no, I mean the, the radar, radar, radar system. Yes, the radar system yeah, doesn't have as good of an accuracy as the ADSB. That's correct. It's slower. It's less frequent. Yes, that's also correct. Even when it's working. Yes. <laughs> Even when right. it's still slow. Yep. Uh, so this is kind of the answer to your question. Unlike transponders, which require an interrogation, these are broadcasting continuously. Okay. The data that you send out can be received by one of, well, they can be received by anybody, but typically they're going to be received by one of two things. They're going to be received by a ground station designed and built and installed by the FAA. Um, and that ground station is... You could think of it like a radar dish. As we'll see in a minute, though, they're dramatically cheaper. And because they're cheaper, they spread them all over the country. So the FAA has these ground stations. I was up in Truckee last weekend. I was on the ground in Truckee. If you've ever flown in that area, radar coverage stops at, Rick, you fly up there all the time. Uh, radar coverage stops somewhere around 9,000 feet. I'm on the ground in Truckee at 6,000 feet. And on the ground, I could see planes in the pattern at Truckee. It was just astounding to me that I'm down in a bowl because there's a ground station nearby. <coughs> I had traffic on the ground at Trekkie. Okay. So the data that I'm transmitting can be received by these ground units. Those ground units are hooked up to ADC, and they see your position, your ID, your everything, as if it's coming from radar. I'm not quite sure if there's some little indication on their screen whether this target is coming off of radar or whether it's coming off of ADSB. <coughs> but in the end, it doesn't really matter. They see you on the scope, and they know where you are. And as you said, the accuracy is even better, and the update rate is even better than they would get from radar. Right? Yeah. According to the avionics shop I'm working with, even in the airplane, you can have CAS or TCAS plus ADSB, and there's voting logic. Yes. So you don't see two targets representing the same airplane. That's correct. If we've got it in the airplane, they probably got it on the ground. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. So it can certainly be, it, it's primarily going to be received by the ground units. So the FAA's got these receivers all over the country, hundreds of them, and I'll show you a map in a little bit. Receivers all over the country, and they're just a well, they're more than just a receiver, but they are a receiver, and so you're transmitting your information continuously they're getting that information, it goes onto their radar screen, they can see you in places that they could not have seen you before with greater accuracy, because you've got a WASP GPS driving the show, transmitting your position. Is it possible, using your example, you could get a false sense of security though? So if you're, say, in Tahoe, and you're, you're flying, you're, you're broadcasting ADSB, and you see a few other people, but there might be other people that are not participating with ADSB that Yes, so there, there's multiple sources of a false sense of security. That's certainly one of them. 
as we'll see, there's a mandate by 2020, almost everybody at that point will have it. But even then, um, you might be in an area where there is no ADSB tower, right? Okay, so you won't see it. Well, in that case, other ADSB equipped aircraft talk to each other and you'd see somebody, but somebody could be out in an ultralight and they're not gonna have anything on it, right? And so, yeah, there's always that chance that there's something in the air that's not transmitting. You bet. Uh, that's what I was saying. Ground receivers send the data to the controller's display for better than radar accuracy. Okay. Aircraft receivers get the data as well. So again, if you're over the Nevada desert, down low, and there's no ground receiver, FAA ground receiver around, and there's another ADSB equipped aircraft, the two of you will talk to each other and you'll see each other. That only works, however, if you're both ADSB equipped. In and out. Yeah, you need in to see and you need out to be present. And you both have to be on the same frequency. The same no. Frequency. No, generally not. And there may be some rare exceptions to that, but generally not. We'll talk about the dual frequencies in a minute, but it, generally not. Most receivers, most ADSB in receivers are dual band. I haven't seen any single band. I'm not sure it's possible. Technologically, it's possible. But all that I know of are dual band in receivers. Stratus, this strat is one single band. Yeah, single this band. First strat is single Oh, the first yeah. strat. Yeah, single band. Okay. The clarity I have is dual band. Right. So, so what does that mean, dual? We'll get to that in a minute. I've got a slide on that. Jumping there. All right, so the ground receivers, now we're talking about the antennas. Who knows where the closest ADSB ground receiver FAA station is? Where the closest, yeah, it's got the right antenna. Yeah, it's on the hillside about a half a mile over there. There's one real close by. There's another one, not quite exactly sure. We'll see when I turn on the iPad, I can show it to you, but it's somewhere over by Palo Alto, San Carlos area. They're sprinkling them all over the place. And the reason they can do that is, in the case of radar, how many radar installation sites are there around the Bay Area? I don't know, one, two, three, because they cost millions to install and maintain. ADSB receivers cost thousands. They're wildly less expensive. So they can sprinkle them all over the place, and they have done so. Right? That's why when I was at Truckee on the ground, I was able to receive one, because they had one on a hill somewhere around Truckee, and I was able to talk to that antenna and see traffic all over the place. Only because you had out. I could have seen traffic that uh, would have been there um, if, it, if I had a portable receiver. I didn't have to have out to see the traffic. You have to have somebody to carry you. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So I don't necessarily have to have out. We'll talk about the false sense of security that can give you. And there's Everyone. no interrogation required. Yes, there is. Turn it on. But you only have at least one aircraft. Yes. But you only get traffic yeah. in your hockey puck. Uh, if your hockey puck yeah. doesn't exist. Yes, that's correct. Then you won't see it. Yes. But as he said, there may be that you would need another aircraft to simulate the system. Right. You'd be seeing the other planes hockey puck. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. But the bottom line is these antennas that the FAA has installed, I'm going to show you a map here in a minute. There's lots and lots of them all over the place to give us much better coverage. Why are they still going to require a mode C transponder after all this gets up? That's a darn good question. I don't know the answer to that. That doesn't make any sense, but that's the case. It's, it's called paranoia. paranoia, right? Maybe. All right, so here's the map. Good old US of A. The color, for those of you who know me, <laughs> I'm colorblind, <laughs> truly, literally. So let's see how well I do on colors here. Blue? Yes. Yay! Yeah. And yellow? Yes. Two. Now this is the one I'm not quite sure. Maybe red? Maybe yeah. red, yeah. Yay, okay. You're great fun with the wazi, by the way. What's that? You're great fun because I can fool you on the wazi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, red, yeah. Right. 
And then we have Alaska here, and we have Hawaii over here, and I think we have Guam over there or something, but I took those out because we're not talking about those places. So the color coding here says the white, um, there's not really too much of that other than maybe the Gulf Coast here, would be you can uh, receive the signal at 1,500 feet. The blue, most of the United States, most of California, you can receive the signal from the ground station at 1,800 feet. As it turns out, right here at Reed Hillview, as we're going to see later on, this little guy, even inside the building here on the ground, we can get the signal. So if you're taxiing around here at Reed Hillview because the antenna is on the hill over there, you can get it on the ground here. But in these blue areas, you're guaranteed to get it by 1,800 feet. You may get lucky and get it lower than that, but by 1,800 feet, you'll get it. Because in the flattest part of the country, it's probably the highest altitude you can get up. So there's nothing between Louisiana and Texas. Oh, you mean above right 10, here? Above 10 feet, yeah. And that's white. Oh, okay. 1,500. Oh, the bottom where it's white. Ah, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Right. One thousand, yeah, there's two different, two different whites in this uh, world. Unless you're colorblind. Are these above ground level? Yes, AGL, that's correct. Yep. So that, that doesn't make sense. How did you see traffic in the traffic pattern in trucking? I got lucky. I got lucky just like I got lucky here at Reed Hillview that there's an antenna close by that's in, in uh, sight of my aircraft. So in full complement, when this is up and running, you won't be able to see traffic in a, in a pattern. Say that again. When the system's up and running. It is now up and running. Well, when everybody's got to have to be out. Okay. You won't be able to see traffic when you're in, a, in, in the traffic pattern. Right? You will. That what they're, this is the guaranteed coverage area in the blue. You will be guaranteed to be able to see planes if you're 1,800 AGL or higher. You may get lucky and see it lower than that, but you're guaranteed to see it by that the altitude. Size, you're probably going to see it. Yeah, you're guaranteed to see it by 1,800 in the blue area. Here at Reed Hillview, we're in a blue area. You're guaranteed to see it by 1,800. We get lucky. The antenna's right there. We get lower than that, but you're guaranteed to see it by 1800 as of today. But and it is up and running. Everybody has it and they're supposed to each other, right? So when everybody has it and they're talking to each other, then, then, they'll, they'll, see it for sure. then they'll see it for sure, yes. It's this or better. Yeah, it's this or better, yes. The, the red, which we've got along the Sierras here, is a little bit of yellow. Uh, is uh, red is 5,000 feet, yellow is 18,000 feet, right? So there is some area, there are some areas here in Nevada, Utah, Colorado, where you have to be pretty darn high. And there's actually been a lot of talk about putting additional antennas kind of down the center of the Rockies here to help with that. How many of you have flown with Lorian from the 1980s, early 90s? Oh, not too many. Who remembers the mid-continent gap? <laughs> she remembers that. So Lorian from the 80s had uh, a bunch of transmitters around the United States. And for many years, the whole system was up and running. But kind of right around here, they didn't have a set of transmitters. And it was called the Mid-Continent Gap, and you couldn't use your Lorian there. And eventually, they put in a set of transmitters there. And that's ultimately the goal. This is what we have today probably what will happen in the next few years. But ultimately, they are going to put more transmitters, so this area will be blue. Are you sure the yellow and the red isn't MSL? Because at 18,000 feet, you wouldn't be 18,000 feet AGL above the mountain. Uh, I understand what you're saying. I don't know the answer to that. Good question. But certainly, you know, this is Lake Tahoe right here. That's blue, and mm -hmm. 1,800 would be underground. Yeah, yeah. I agree. <coughs> yeah, but bottom line is you can see for most of the United States, you're guaranteed coverage by 1,800 feet. There are parts, certainly along the Rockies, maybe it's some along the Sierras where you have to be higher. But generally, for most of the United States today, and certainly into the future, 1,800 or higher, your guaranteed coverage. Below those altitudes, you may or may not have something. Why use it? Well, first off, it's going to be required. The deadline is January 1st, 2020. Does everybody have to have it? Who 
has to have it on January 1st, 2020? Yeah, that's the simplest way to say it. If you fly in airspace today that requires a transponder, a class Bravo, class Charlie, above class Charlie, above 10,000, if you fly in airspace that requires a transponder today, in 2020, you're going to be required to have ADSB out so that you transmit your position. Okay? And the FAA has repeatedly said no extensions. Remember, two or three years ago, uh, television broadcasts went from analog to digital and they gave I don't know, a six month extension. The FAA says, we ain't doing that. When we say January 1st, we mean January 1st. So I would not count on that. And I've seen a couple of studies that if you divide up the number of airplanes in the United States by the number of avionics shops in the United States, by the number of days, it's like every avionics shop is going to have, from now until January 1st, 2020, every avionics shop is going to have to do five a day. I don't know what the number is, but it's more than one a day, which is why I, I updated those companies. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why I updated my plane just a few months ago because I didn't want to get caught in that crunch. My shop tells me that the backlog for the Garmin GDL88 was a few days until a few until a week or two ago, and it suddenly jumped up to a month. Well, I put an 88 in my plane back in May, uh, and there was no backlog at that time, so it could have changed. Who knows if it's because of the deadline and people are seeing it or they've had a production glitch, I, I don't know. But what it is today, you can guarantee in 2018 and 2019, you're going to be in a, a world of hurt. And if you want to fly in airspace that's going to require it, now's the time to do it, not by the price. You probably reduce the price, right? Well, that's what a lot of people are hoping for, is they're hoping that you know the cost of the units, which are certainly not cheap, will decline over time. I've got a whole page on that. Just <laughs> out. I've got a whole page on that. Have you heard anything about the government underwriting some of the costs? I have. I know that Australia did it. Uh, ADSB is required in Australia, and the way I heard it, I don't know if it's a hundred percent true somewhat apocryphal, is that they paid, the Australian government paid everybody to do it to their planes uh, because they looked at just putting in a few new radar sites, it was cheaper to pay to equip all the planes. And you could use that same kind of logic in the United States, and people have said, we ought to follow that kind of logic. But I doubt if they'll ever do it. How long does it take to get to Australia? <laughs> yeah, I, I would be very surprised if they do that. Very surprised. Okay, so why use it? Well, it's required, and it's, it will allow controllers to space aircraft much closer, although if you're flying a 172 or an Archer or something like that, I'm not sure that's a big deal to you. If you're flying a 737, it might be a big deal. Okay. You get free traffic and weather in your cockpit. That is a big deal. I've been flying with, for a while with the portable units, and for a few months now with it installed in my aircraft, and I can tell you, it's a big deal. If you're used to, for example, XM weather in the, in the cockpit, uh, the ADSB weather information is not 100% as good as the uh, XM stuff, but I'd give it an 80%. It's pretty darn close, and it's free. You don't have to pay $50, $70 a month, and you get traffic, and I fly with TIS traffic and TCAS traffic in a lot of the Tradewinds planes, and I gotta tell you, the ADSB traffic is better than the TCAS traffic, better than the TIS traffic. Of all the traffic systems out there, I believe the ADSB traffic is the best. So the weather is very good, not perfect, but very good, and the traffic is perfect. Where does it fall down? Where's the weather? There's no satellite in ADSB. There's no satellite, it's all off the ground station. No, no, I mean, there's no you know, satellite. Oh, there's no visible picture. picture. I don't think XM has a visible picture either. No, it does. It does. I mean, it's satellite. They have cloud coverage. They show cloud coverage. They do show cloud coverage, but it's a, it's not a photo. It's a mosaic that they right. built up of their own. Yeah. Right. But XM doesn't have cloud coverage. Right. right. 
Well, it's so th there's several items that, many not several, there's a couple of items that are not existent in ADSB. Uh, for example, lightning is today not existent in ADSB and is existent in XM weather, right? So that's an example. But again, I said it's 80%, it's pretty close. The radar image is a little better in XM than it is in ADSB, but it's still plenty good enough with the ADSB. And it's free. Did I mention? <laughs> yes, it's free. Okay, let's talk about out versus in. I think that confuses a bunch. So ADSB out. What is ADSB out? ADSB out is you transmitting your position out to the world. That's what we talked about earlier, where you need the GPS was enabled source. So that as you transmit to the world, you're telling everybody where you are. FAA. That is ADSB out. It's you telling the world where you are. ADSB in is the reception of data by your aircraft, particularly we're talking about traffic and weather. It's not just on the gates, it's continuous. Neither direction, neither out nor in, requires the other. You can have an ADSB out transmitter in your plane and not receive traffic and weather. It'd be kind of silly to do that because you're paying a fair amount of money to install that out and get none of the free benefits. But if you wanted to, you could do that. There's no rule that says you have to receive because you transmit. Likewise, you could have a Stratus or a Garmin device and receive it and not transmit your own position. There's lots of folks who are doing that today. The weather port, the weather part of that equation, receiving, doing the in, works really well. The traffic part, as we'll see later, doesn't work so well. So in 2020, is it you have to have in and out? No, in 2020 out? you have to have out. You have to tell everybody where you are. Yes. But the bottom line is, neither direction requires the other. Legally speaking, you can have in without out, somewhat limiting if you do that. You can have out without in, and it's silly to do it, why spend all the money and not get the benefit, but neither direction requires the other. Okay. You have to have out because you have to have out, not because you have in. Neither direction requires the other. It's the mandate that requires the out, not the fact that you have one or the other. Okay. Mostly, as we'll see later, mostly, those two directions are independent. But the bottom line is, what to remember is, out is you transmitting data out of your aircraft to other aircraft into the ground station, in is you receiving data into your aircraft, which is basically traffic and weather. All right, so what is the mandate? ADSB out, you transmitting your position is going to be required. That's the regulation right there, 91.225. And if you read that, it goes into great detail. 91.225 says you're going to have to have ADSB out by January 1st, 2020. which is, as we said, basically in all places where a mode C is required today. So that's class B, within the 30 mile veil, class C, above class C, above 10,000, and as John so nicely pointed out, they still have to have, they still are requiring us to have a transponder and I have no clue why that makes any sense at all, but that's the way it is. The FAA says even though you've got ADSB out, um, 2020, you still have to have a transponder. Beats me. <laughs> so they still have an assigned coach? Yes. So they, they, you'll have a transponder, so they'll still assign a code. That's correct. Yep. ADSB in is not required at all, ever. As I've already said three or four times, why would you do the out portion, spend all that money, and not get the benefit? So, 
not required, but it's logical that you would want it as long as you're uh, transmitting the position. And so how do you comply? To meet the mandate, you're going to need an ADSB out device. And that device must be connected, as I've said already, to a WAS enabled GPS. Some of those devices can contain <coughs> their own independent WAS enabled GPS. So one of the more popular out units is the Garmin GDL88. The GDL88 comes actually in four flavors, two of which are with or without the WAS enabled GPS receiver built in. And the prices vary significantly because of that. So you can get a real cheap one, not real cheap, but you can get a less expensive one without a GPS uh, receiver, or you can get a more expensive one that does have a GPS uh, receiver. And your WASP receiver is your, your ads in? No. Uh, WASP receiver's got nothing to do with in. It's only the out. So uh, the bottom line, though, is that the out portion has to transmit your position, so it's getting that position from a GPS, a loss enabled GPS. You can have a device like the GDL88 that has its own GPS built in, or if you've got a Garmin 430, 530, 650, 750 in your plane that is already a loss enabled GPS receiver, you can take the output of that, run it into your GDL88 or whatever your output is and get the source from there. So it can be either an internal GPS source or it can be an external GPS source driving that output signal. Well, I thought the, the GDL88 was in. No, well, it's a bidirectional unit. Oh. It's actually a transceiver, isn't it? That's what bidirectional means. <laughs> Sorry, I had to tweak you there, Rich. <laughs> Okay, so some devices contain and some devices connect, right? So your out device has to somehow know its position. It can either be internal or external, but somehow it needs to know where it is so that it can transmit that data. Okay. This quick, what's the Garmin that's the in only with and all of that? The GDO and some other not? They do not have an in only unit. Garmin does not. The one that you have there. That, well, oh, I'm sorry, for a panel mount, they do not have an in-only unit. Oh, yeah. They have the uh, portable unit, that device right there, that's a GDL-39. Oh, yeah. okay. GDL-39. How many zeros are we talking about? Oh, for that, uh, the GDL-39 comes in two flavors, the latest version and the original, that's the original. The original now, I believe, is like 500 bucks. Uh, the newest one, which includes an AHARS, and so that on your iPad you'll be able to have a glass panel. I think those are eight or nine hundred bucks, something like that. But that is, those are input devices, not output devices. They receive, they don't transmit. Okay. Um, yeah, so the ADSB out device is a blind device, just like the blind encoder for remote C. So, for example, the GDL88 is out there transmitting your position all the time, but you don't see it, you don't know it, you don't anything, and it's just there. Okay. Are there any dials or buttons that you push? For the out device, no. For the GDL? It's out, for any out device. I can put it in the baggage compartment. In many cases, the, in my case, the device itself, the GDL-88, is in the tail, and there are no wires or knobs or buttons that connect up to the front of the plane that I have access to. When you turn the power on it? It's going. It's going. It's okay. going. Yep. So that's what I'm trying to get at here. You know, the blind encoder. You ever turn on the blind encoder for your transponder? No. No, you don't turn it on. It's just always there. Hidden. Right. Okay. This is what gets a little bit complicated. Um, there are two frequencies. There were some questions about this earlier. Okay. Most people don't talk about these two frequencies in terms of the frequency numbers. They talk about them in terms of what type of device they are. But if you're flying below flight level 180, 
you need a nine, you don't need, you can use a 978 megahertz device. And I did some research and I'm pretty sure I've got this correct, that it's not what the aircraft is certified to, it's what you are actually flying that day. So, Rich, for example, your plane is certified to 27,000 feet. I know that because I used to own the plane before Rich. <laughs> but if Rich, I didn't even know that. <laughs> there you go. But if Rich decided that he never wanted to go above flight level 180 or, or to flight level 180, and he just decided that, yeah, yeah, my plane could go there, but I'm going to restrict myself, and I'm going to never go above 180, or even two, one eight zero. Then he could use a nine seventy eight device. But you have to make that decision when you install it, because you're installing this kind of device, or you're installing this kind of device. And if you say, well, I'll never go above flight level one eight zero, and so I'm going to install a nine seventy eight device. And then two years later, you say, you know what? It really would be nice if I got up to flight level two zero zero someday. You can't get there because you installed the wrong device, right? So you cannot go to. Okay. Yes, it's prohibited to go above that. That's with correct. That. With that device. That's correct. Now, it does turn out that these devices are generally less expensive. Not wildly, but slightly less expensive. Okay? That's the frequency, but the way that most people refer to them are UAT devices. Right? UAT is Universal Access Transceiver. So if you know, if for example you have a 172, how many times is a 172 getting up to flight level 180? Answer that is never. Okay, then I will get a UAT device because it is slightly less expensive. Why should I spring for the more expensive stuff if I'm never going to use it? But if you're like Rich and you might someday go up above flight level 180, you probably wouldn't want to do that. And in my aircraft, my aircraft is certified, and I do go above 180. I made the decision right from the get-go. I'm not going to get one of these because I want to have the ability to go higher. Okay. Also, this frequency is ADSB in the United States only. Canada, Mexico, Europe, Asia, Antarctica, everybody else uses the other frequency. So if you think you're going to go to Canada someday, or Mexico, or the Caribbean, or wherever it may be, this is probably not what you want. You do not want a UAT, because that is only for the United States. And we're talking about any altitude in Canada. That's correct. Mexico. That's correct. Their, their ground stations do not receive 978. So at any altitude, it doesn't make any difference, because they don't, they don't have those kind of receivers. What is their device? I do not know. They actually started in Canada first, right? The idea? No, the idea was in Alaska. It was called the Capstone Project. Oh, Alaska. Okay, Alaska. Okay, the other frequency is 1090 megahertz, so the frequencies aren't too far apart. Uh, any aircraft can have a 1090. So if you have a 172, that's not going up to flight level 180 ever, you can still install a 1090 device in there. It's legal. Because, for example, you might take that 172 to Canada where 1090 is what's required, or Mexico, or the Caribbean, or anywhere else, right? So all aircraft can have that. But it's the more expensive spread. So if you're only going to stay below 180 and only fly in the United States, you might go for the less expensive UAT device. Here's the question. If you, if you have the 1090, I assume you can go below it. You can fly. Yes, <laughs> yes. That, well, that was my point. So anybody can do a 1090 device. <coughs> anybody. Yeah. Okay. Right? So if I have a 172 or even a 182, now I have to say to myself, well, I'm never going above flight level 180 in those planes. Am I ever going to Canada? Am I ever going to Mexico? If I say to myself, no, I'm never going to Canada or Mexico, and I'm never going above flight level 180, I'll probably go for the less expensive UAT device. In Canada and Mexico, is it the same airspace requirements, the equivalent of class? I don't know the rules in other countries. Yeah, I don't have a clue. In the other countries, is it uh, by the year 2020 also? 
Don't have a clue. Are you going to talk about the, uh, the difference in cost? Yes, I've got some uh, prices, uh, a sheet here with some of the prices. Yeah. The 1090 units, the, the 978 units, are commonly referred to as a UAT device. The uh, flight level 180, 1090, those are called the extended squitter devices. Is anyone squitting right now? <laughs> I am. Not. I'm squitting. Squitting is transmitting data. I'm giving you guys data here, right? A normal transponder squits. The extended squitter is, generally speaking, a transponder that is, in addition to its normal transponder, adding data and transmitting more than just simple transponder returns. It's giving you extended data. So an example of a uh, ES device is the Garmin uh, 330. That comes in a normal Garmin 330 or a extended squitter Garmin 330. Do you still have to have the other transponder or, or, this, or, or do you just modify your current one to extend it? Yes. So if you have a Garmin 330, for example, and it's a not extended squitter device, you can upgrade that to an extended squitter device. It is still functioning as a regular transponder, and it also functions as an, ex an extended squitter device. The Garmin 330 without the extended squitter, is that a mode S? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You're saying that the ADSB out devices ordered for UAT have the transmitter inside the GDL88 or whatever, the ASBA out device. But if you want to use 1090, it's not built into that device. You have to get another transponder. You have to get a transponder that's an extended squitter device. I don't know of, and I don't even know if it's theoretically possible, to have a 1090 device that is not a transponder. I don't think that's possible. I think if you get a 1090 device, it's a transponder that is an extended <coughs> squitter. In other words, it takes two boxes to do the 1090, whereas the 978 can be done with one box. No, not really. No, the, the 330 in the extended squitter version is one box. To you, it well, looks that, like a transponder. That's right. You don't need the GDL88 that's for the out function. Correct. Oh, so the, the extended squitter transponder does what the 88 does. Well, the 88 is bi-directional, in and out. So if you want to get 1090 out and something in, do you need both a 978 device that happens to be in and out plus yes. a new transponder? Yes. So I'll tell you what I did in my plane. So in my plane, I put in a 330 extended squitter. So that's the out device. It's a transponder that is extended squitter, transmitting my position. But that device does not receive data. It's not in in data. So I had to get a second device. In my case, it was a GDL88, which is bidirectional. And I turned off the output side of it. They don't sell one that's in a Garmin, uh, not Garmin does not, no. Um, and so I have two, conceptually, two devices. One that's a 1090 device, one that's a 978 device. And on the 978 device, I turned off the transmission part and use it only for the receive part. Is there a requirement that you can't transmit on both? I'm not aware of such a requirement, but it seems like it would be confusing to the ground station because it's getting two signals from the same aircraft at the same position, and how does it resolve that conflict? I don't know. I, I, why you would want to do that in the first place, I don't know. And whether it's legal, I don't know either. So then you would not get uh, uh, SB in in a foreign country. I, I didn't understand. Say it again. So if you're if you're if you're, if you're getting data on 978. Yes. All data in comes 978. There is no in on 1090. All in data is 978. And that's outside of the U.S. as well? The U.S. is the only country in the world that does ADSB in. 
You go to Canada, you're transmitting your position. They see you, you don't see them. All ADSB in comes on 978 UAT. So if you want data link weather in Canada, you're stuck with that too. That's correct. How about other aircraft? Uh, no, that's good. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yes. So in Canada, everybody's going to be 1090 extended splitter, and those aircraft that are ADSB out equipped will be able to talk to one another, so you will see other ADSB traffic. You won't see other non-ADSB traffic, but you will see other ADSB traffic. That's correct. Does, does Canada then not have the, the same exceptions to the rule that we have, like uh, aircraft without an electrical system? I don't know the rule. I don't know the rules in Canada, so I don't know. Just curious. Yeah, I don't have a clue. There's folks here that don't have to do this. Yeah, but there are. You're correct. There are exceptions to the mandate. But how many planes at Reed Hillview were originally certified with no electrical system? I'm sure there's a couple of aircraft here, but I'll bet it's less than five percent. Probably less than one percent. So yeah, there are exceptions, but not very big. Christian, the GDLAD can have both in and out. Yes. But it's got to have the 978 frequency for it. It is. And it is a 978 unit. It's not an okay. extended squitter unit. So it doesn't have 1090 at all? It doesn't have it at all. I thought it had both. It, it does not. It, it has in and out. But in and out, on the, on the GDL 88, it's in and out on UAT 978. In and out on this. Yeah, but I thought it was a dual frequency. It, it transmits and receives here. It receives here. So that it tra if it's in a location where there are no ground units retransmitting other aircraft, you're over the Nevada desert, it transmits its position on 978. It receives other aircraft on 978, and it also receives aircraft on 1090. And it sorts it out and gets it from both? Yes. That's what I said earlier. ADSB in is always 978. From the ground. Yeah, thank you. That's correct. Yeah, if I'm talking directly aircraft to aircraft, that could be, it could be both. Yes, that's right. All right, we were talking earlier about cost. This list is not exhaustive, but I got a few examples for you so you can see what it is. We've been talking about GDL-88 because it's one of the more popular units out there. It's Garmin's flagship ADSB product. Uh, GDL-88 is a bi-directional unit and varies between $3,500 and $5,000 plus installation. Uh, the difference is, uh, well, first off, this is a UAT device. Should have put that on here. It's a UAT device. It, um, it's out and in. UAT means it's 978 megahertz. It means it can't be used, it can't go out above flight level 180. It can't go out in Canada. So it will receive a direct signal from, from other aircraft. From That's good. How do they know about you or like that? That's correct. Uh, the variation in price, there's actually four price points in here. The big difference in the price points are whether you buy a unit with the uh, built-in GPS or whether you use some external GPS. Well, what's the diversify? That's the other variation. Diversification, I don't know why they use that term. It's kind of a <coughs> poor choice of word. Diversity refers to the fact that you will be listening to other aircraft as well as listening to ground stations. You're listening to other aircraft. Is that other aircraft above you or below you? If you have one antenna and it's underneath you, that's great for talking to ground stations. That's great for talking to other aircraft that are below you. But your own aircraft provides a shadow to some aircraft above you. Diversity says, I'm going to give you a second antenna on the top of the aircraft so that you'll never have a shadow created by your own aircraft. Okay, And that's the other 
factor in 3,500 versus 5,000. I believe that GPS, if we get a non-diversity, they have a name for that that I forget, but if you get a non-diversity, one antenna, and no GPS, that's the 3,500. If you get the GPS and the two antennas, the diversity, that's the 5,000. And then you can get somewhere in the middle with one antenna or two antennas with or without GPS, and that's why there's different price points in there. But the high and the low of it is in this range, plus installation. And what does that cost, roughly speaking? Oh, an installation? Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to vary significantly. You know, is the aircraft pressurized? Is there enough power? Do you need new circuit breakers, so on and so forth? But I would guess it's in the range of a day to two days worth of labor somewhere in that range. So, so this play device is for ADS and ADS? It's whatever you want it to be, right? So uh, a Garmin 430-530 is capable of accepting that data and displaying the information. Um, on the GDL-88, um, at least on this unit, uh, it only there's no provisions to go to a portable device. So if you had a GDL-88 and you're transmitting your position, you want to get traffic and weather on your iPad, now it cannot go to a portable device. It has to be hardwired into some display. So if you've got a KMD uh, 550 display, Tradewinds has that in a bunch of our planes, I'm pretty sure that one will interface to the 88, right? But you need some sort of panel-mounted display unit to be able to see the data that's coming in. I thought they, they offered like a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth. Uh, they do, but that's extra money as well. Oh, <laughs> I don't think it's shipping either. Yes, they do. Uh, and that's only been out for like a month now. I don't know anyone who's installed that. Uh, but yeah, they do offer one just, like I said, in the last month or so they put that out. But so you buy the Garmin Pilot program for your iPad or whatever you need? Yes. I have a uh, 330 extended squitter for the output because I go above flight level 180. So that's the out. The in, I have the GDL-88, which is a bi-directional unit, and I don't want to transmit, so I've turned off the output side of that, and I use that for the input side. And then what do you display that on? I have a Garmin 750 touchscreen, and it displays up on there. All right, so as I said earlier, the uh, 88 is a 978 megahertz unit only, and as, as Rick has correctly said, the only uh, refers to the transmit. It does receive on both if it's talking to another aircraft on 1090. Uh, this is the popular one if you are looking to fly above flight level 180. Uh, Garmin 330 transponder with extended squitter. Around four grand, I think it's actually slightly more than that, it's like maybe 4,500 plus installation. It's a 1090 unit. Ranger, uh, this is a 978 unit. It's both out and in. 3,000 to 4,500, slightly less expensive than the GDL-8. And again, the price points vary with diversity and whether or not you have uh, its own internal uh, GPS or you're using the external source. If you want weather, don't you need 1090 as well? No, the 1090, all of the data into the plane yeah. is 978. Oh, okay, so the weather comes on 978? Traffic and weather is on 978. Okay. I was going to say, except that the direct signal from the other aircraft could be. Is, is it's both. It's both, yeah. If you're talking aircraft to aircraft without a ground station involved, the other aircraft could be 978, the other aircraft could be 1090. And most of the 978 units on the receive end receive both. And is there a te technology based the reason why you actually pick one? The rest of the world has picked just one. We decided to be weird. The reason they decided to go with two frequencies is the, the bandwidth is limited because we transmit traffic and weather data back up to the cockpit. The rest of the world does not do that. 
So they separated out and they tried to figure out how are we going to make some of the aircraft go this way and some of the aircraft go this way, and they decided they were going to do that based on altitude. I guess that's as good as any other choice. Uh, and it was a bandwidth consideration because we transmit in the United States traffic and weather that the rest of the world does not do. NAVWORKS as a uh, 978 unit for um, 2500, I'm pretty sure but not 100% sure that this device can't be ordered with a um, internal GPS, that you'll have to have some sort of external GPS source for this. Not 100% sure, but I think that's the case. But as I was doing some research at you know what units are out there, this was one of the least expensive units that I had found. But I mean, if you look at it, 2,500 to 5,000 is kind of the range of prices. You're not going to find one even five years from now. There's not going to be a $300 unit. Just never going to happen. Maybe five years from now, when everybody is rushing because they are waiting till the deadline. There will be a $1,000 unit. There's not going to be a $300 unit. Just not going to happen. Right? So the range is $2,500 to about $5,000. And this one is less expensive because it doesn't have an internal GPS. Tim, it seems to me in you know, four years, 11 months, boy, the, the, there's not much reason for any of these companies to be manufacturing these in quantity because the only quantity you need is the number of new airplanes kicked out. And right now you've got a. I'm not following well, that. Right now you've got hundreds of thousands of airplanes out there that need this in yes. five years. After five years from now, the only planes that they'll that they'll oh. need those things. Yeah, in 2025, for example. Yeah. And hopefully everybody will have equipped. 2021. 2021. Uh, right, right. Everyone will have equipped more or less, so and only new aircraft will need it. So it's not like there's going to be a ramp up and buy them like chips, like some of your Yes, that, I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but you're absolutely some correct. Some in 2017. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, after the mandate is done, everybody's equipped. The manufacturing is going to fall off a cliff. So no incentive to really beef up for it. Well, the incentive is they make money every time they sell one of these. So you know, if the demand's there, they'll sell them. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put money in your company to grow it. Perhaps so. You're not going to wrap up your manufacturing. So you're, yeah. you're going to have a big crunch in 2020 to keep in stock. Well, there will still be sales and new airplanes. Yeah, but how know. many aircraft did Cessna build last year? <laughs> Under 500. Wow. We're not talking about tons of units. And they're the biggest manufacturer. Five years is a good uh, lifetime to protect the bike. Turn around on yeah. in history. That's true. So all these the things become obsolete. Right. Awesome. <coughs> Anyway, that's right. So, so, so there's no nothing really different to change. These that's ten years from now, they'll all be obsolete. That's correct. And, and they'll be selling you the whatever's new. The new device. That's exactly correct. But with these devices, the point of this slide was I wanted to give people a, a basic ballpark figure. And yeah, somebody's going to come out with a device next year that'll be two thousand. Maybe a couple of years, somebody will come out with a fifteen hundred dollar one. But they're never going to be coming out with a three hundred dollar unit. And even if they did, the installation on it's going to be five, six, seven hundred dollars. So if you're waiting to do this because you think prices are going to fall off a cliff, that's just not going to happen. For myself, and some of the articles that I've read, how much room you have in your panel is going to be an issue in terms of just probably not. No, the only reason you need any room, any room at all in your panel, is for a display device, okay. right? So if you don't have room for a display device, okay, well then maybe you could do what Rich was saying is you get a GDL88 with a Bluetooth connection to an iPad. But the, the out device is a blind device. It sits in the tail somewhere and you don't need any panel space at all. So what's the cheapest out only device? Uh, the NatWorks device. Yeah. But, but you say that's out only? Yeah. I don't know of any out-only devices. There's probably one there that I wasn't wasn't able to find, but it's still not going to be a thousand bucks. Yeah, King has a uh, has a inbox, which is like about twenty percent less expensive than the GDL eighty eight. Perhaps so. Yep. Yeah. But it's not half price. No. I think the out requires. Yes, that's correct. Yep. 
That's exactly correct. Um, questions. Uh, so you, you said that we still have to have um, nodes that transform. That's correct. Right. So then, uh, let's talk antennas. All right. right. So uh, do I share my antenna with the... So if it is a, um, this transponder, the 1090 units, that frequency is not an accident. That is the frequency that transponders use today, right? So in the case of a 1090 device, your transponder is the extended squitter device. It's all one in the same, and it uses that antenna, okay. right? If you're transmitting on 978, then yes, you'll need a separate a separate antenna for that. Uh, uh, the weather and on the end does that come only from the ground station? Yes, the in data weather is ground based uh, from the ground transmitters only. Eventually, they're going to have the, the plan, I think, is eventually have satellites, right? To, you know, this is all terrestrial. Okay. Well, too expensive. The whole point of this is it's cheap. Not for you, but for the FAA. <laughs> right? And satellites are wildly oh. expensive. I guess I'm thinking of next gen. Yes, it does, that, but that's that's not ADSB. That's other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But they advertise that they are taking advantage of the GPS satellite configuration. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, they're taking they advantage of, but they're not launching new satellites. ADSB in, free traffic, and it works really well. All right, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. The traffic is shown within 25 miles of your position. How does that happen? If you have an out device in your aircraft and you're transmitting your position, you stimulate the ground receivers, the FAA's antenna. And when you talk to that ground antenna, you say, here I am. The antenna on the ground says, oh, there's an aircraft out there. I'm going to transmit back all of the aircraft near that aircraft. He's out there, I'll give him the benefit of traffic around him. So it transmits, I've stimulated the system, I've transmitted my position to the ground, it hands back the traffic and shows me all the traffic within 25 miles of me. If there is another aircraft nearby who is not ADSB equipped, but he, uh, who's not ADSB out, but he has one of these GDL 39s and he's listening for the in he'll see the traffic that's transmitted for me. But he's not, hopefully, in my exact same position. He's some miles away. But what does he see? He sees all the traffic around me. Now, suppose he's 20 miles away from me. He'll see all the traffic around me, because I'm the one who stimulated the system to transmit traffic. And he'll look at that traffic and say, oh, there's a lot of traffic over there but no traffic over there. <laughs> yeah, let's go that way. That's not correct. It, what the system wasn't stimulated to transmit the traffic that's over there. It was only stimulated by me, because I'm transmitting my position, and so it transmits back the traffic around me. And the guy who's got the GL39 will look at that and say, I'm receiving traffic. I know where everybody is. Not the case. Very deceptive. So. You activate the system, and the system or the radar will transmit everything he knows. All of the data he knows, not just ADSB traffic, all traffic that he knows. Well, what, what other traffic does he know Non-ADSB traffic that is transponder equipped. Oh, so he gets transponder information. He gets everything that the controller can see, whether the controller is seeing it by ADSB whether the controller is seeing it by transponder, whatever the, the controller sees, I will see that because I've stimulated the system. 25 miles around me. He's also stimulating the system. He's not stimulating the ADSB traffic. No, he is not. He shows up. He shows up, 
but he's not causing the ground-based ADS-B antenna to broadcast back traffic. To rebroadcast. To re he's not stimulating the rebroadcast of traffic. Okay. So he sees everything that was sent to you, plus any air-to-air -air that's within range. The, that non-ADS-B out aircraft? No, no, no. ADS-B out aircraft that are within air-to-air -air range. Let me go back to my example. I've got ADS-B. I'm stimulating ground station. It transmits all traffic that the controller will see within 25 miles of me. The guy who's 20 miles over there, who has only ADS-B in, will see all of the traffic that's been transmitted to me. And if there is another ADS-B traffic, further beyond him, another 20 miles that way, who's sending out his position, he'll receive that, see that one aircraft. aircraft. But not any other aircraft that might be in that vicinity. So it doesn't transmit all the aircraft that we know so? No, it does all not. All the aircraft which is about 25 of them around you. 25 up, and again, the reason it's doing that is because they're bandwidth limited. If they were transmitting all aircraft all the time, there's not enough bandwidth for that. So it's aircraft that were within 25 miles of me, and I'm stimulating the system. That aircraft over there is not transmitting his position. He's not stimulating the system. He's not getting traffic around him. He's only seeing the stuff that's being transmitted because of me. So, so then in the limit, if there's no ADS-B out transmitting planes, anyone with ADS-B in only will see nothing. Will see nothing. That's correct. Yeah, it's it's not a good deal. There's a lot of people who complain about that very fact. Yes. Say it, say it again. So, what was said, let me repeat it to be clear. If there are no ADSB out aircraft in the neighborhood, but everybody in the neighborhood has a GDL 39 and is receiving in, but nobody's stimulating the system, there is no traffic being transmitted, that GDL 39 will say, you're in the clear. Go fly anywhere you want, go and hit anything. It's kind of neat though, because a guy in 2020 that would be stimulated by everybody who has to have a transponder. So a guy can just have one of those and fly one of those old planes, at least know where everybody else is. Well because 2020, everybody else who's got a transponder is going to be stimulating the system all over. That's assuming that you're not flying in the middle of Nevada where nobody's got a transponder. Right? So if nobody in the middle of Nevada but they has still a have, but they still have to transmit ADSP. Even if they're flying in Nevada, right? No, because there's no class Charlie, there's no over 10,000 feet. They're not where you need a transponder, so they don't transmit their ADS B. But no, you have it, you have it on when you turn your plane on. By 2020, they're, they're flying in 2020. In 2020, not everybody will have ADS B out. No, you have other people that, that have old planes that won't play there. No, or or people who just don't go done. near Charlie and Bravo airspace. Right. Right? So, yes, you could have. The, the chance of the system being stimulated increases dramatically as we get to 2020. But it is still possible that you'll be in a place where there are no aircraft stimulating the system and there are still aircraft. It's, it's much less likely in 2020, but it's still possible. Did you say earlier that if there was a ground-based radar station, that that the information it's picking up, so it would pick up non adsb right? Yes. That that would also be pushed into the ADSB into you. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, so it is. If you happen to be lucky enough to be in an area where there's ground-based radar, then you have a better chance of knowing where everybody is. No. Because no. Transmit transmit. Because it doesn't transmit anything until it's stimulated by an out aircraft. Once it's stimulated, then it transmits everything within 25 miles, whether right. it's ADS-B or radar or anything. I'm kind of assuming that you have ADS-B out. Okay, if you were to assume that, then that's correct. And does that mean that if there's a busy airspace with lots of airplanes, every airplane is getting his own dedicated transmission for the 25 miles around that airplane on a periodic basis? Um, I don't know. No, the, the broadcast is a uh, in-the-blind broadcast. So there must be some algorithm that says, okay, here's a guy and another guy that's five miles away. I'm not going to broadcast a set of data for this guy 
and an almost identical set of data for this guy. No, they'll just say, okay, I'll broadcast a 30 mile ring for those two aircraft or something similar. And it's up to the receivers to filter out the yes. stuff. Yes, and I do know that, that part is true, that the receivers do have filters to figure it out. Mm -hmm. The ones that are not doing AB, ABDS, ABESD out have to be on a transponder to be seen. You have to have a transponder. Yeah, so I understand that. Um, I don't know. I did some research and never could find an answer to that. So radar today, they call it a primary and a secondary right. return. Right. A primary return for a guy at a radar scope is an aircraft without transponder. It's not very accurate. No, it's not very accurate. And it lacks some data, like altitude. Transmit that. I don't know if they transmit that or not. The secondary return what APC calls a secondary return is what they see on radar from a transponder. I don't know if ADSB transmits the primary data, the radar reflection only no transponder data. I don't know. I tried to find that out. What they if the TIS includes altitude as part of the data, it wouldn't have it on a primary target. Well, it might. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have altitude, but it still might transmit without the altitude. They could just leave that data field blank. I don't know what they do. I, like I said, I did some research. I couldn't find an answer to that question. Um, so if, I think you probably already covered this, but if, if you have two, two planes, they say my plane and another plane in the vicinity, and they both have outs, and they both have ins, you, you were saying that they will filter out. You won't get my hockey puck and the other plane's hockey puck. You will not see double images. Okay, so they, you'll only... Essentially, will they limit it to your own hockey puck in that case? No, if, if I'm here and there's another aircraft 30 miles away, 50 miles away, and I can receive the signal from the ground station that's broadcasting his hockey puck, I'll receive that data and see those aircraft even though they're more than 25 miles from me. Oh, okay. So it's just they eliminate the duplication? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I have two questions. One is, that would be an awful lot of information on a screen. Every airplane flying within 25 miles of me at San Carlos. You'd be surprised it's not as bad as you think. Well, when everyone's doing it, though, it seems like they've been... Well, I'm stimulating the system with my plane now, so I see everybody within 25 miles of me. Who's got a radio? Who's, who's, who's got a transponder? Who's, you got a nice big screen, though. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. The other question is, I mean, this is what year is this? 2014 or something like that. Is there any kind of security? Oh, something like that, yeah. Rock it, it is already possible with uh, about a $20 USB software defined radio to pretend you're an airplane at a particular transponder code and broadcast whatever you want to say you are. Okay. So, so I can put one out here and tell someone I'm at 2,000 feet. 15, or 15 miles out or 10 miles out, and it would show up on ATC. ATC. And then I can move myself over real quickly, and nobody knows where I'm coming from. Is there any authentication or security in this system? Because once everyone counts on this, it would be remarkably easy to hack. And in a Beats sense, me. I've never looked at it. You can declutter the screen and just use your eyes. Another question. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that would be kind of a radical concept. Do you know if they've got any idea of how they're going to handle what the drones? Was about that? Not part of the, no. system. The, the whole drone thing. issue is such a mess it's right now. It's not going to be part of the system at all. Well, it could conceivably, but they haven't. They have. There's so much unknown about drones that it's just not even worth discussing. It's so wild. They'll at least be transponding Clark 1200 right now. At least to the target. You had a question? I didn't see it. No, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Just today, went through an entire uh, ground course from AOPA mm -hmm. on ABSB. Uh, all I suspect is old. But there, they said your aircraft is only going to uh, um, transmit with your position. You're out. Is only going to transmit on one of those frequencies. That's correct. Okay. okay. Yep, that's correct. So it assumes then that the ground station assumes that if 
this other guy over here is only transmitting on the other frequency. Yep. That the ground station is going to need to retransmit that aircraft back to me because I cannot receive it. It's assuming that I do not have dual reception. Because if everybody yeah. has, it, 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 I may have, but it assumes that I don't. That's correct. So, so it's going to. It's going to retransmit everything. It's going to retransmit it because some of the folks out there, at least, let's say as of last year, only received. My channel, I only right. receive half of those aircraft. Right. Most of the receivers days. these days are dual band, though. Yeah. Like, I don't know of any single band receivers, and, and but it could be. And they made no mention of dual band. That's, that's why I asked. Yeah. Most of the, the GDL, the, the ones that I showed up there were all dual band. Okay. Right. The traffic that you get has a vector showing you where he's going. Uh, in general, a tail number, not always, because if it's a transponder only aircraft, it won't have the tail number and altitude. Uh, it shows direction? Th th that's the vector idea. Oh, yes. vector, I see. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's based on what the controller sees, so you get both transponder and ADS speed transmit. But this is what we were talking about earlier. If there's no transponder, if you're a primary target, and you have no transponder, no ADSB, no target. I'm not 100% sure of that, but that's what I thought I was reading, that if there's no transponder and no ADSB, then you don't get that target. You know, some guy's out flying in a Piper Cub, no electrical system, no nothing. <coughs> ATC may see him on radar, but I don't think you get that back in the ADSB traffic. I'm not sure. I didn't say my question right. Do you see if they're climbing or descending? Yes, you do. Yeah. There's in addition to a uh, horizontal vector, there's a vertical vector. Yep. And uh, the traffic, as we've been saying a couple times, in areas where there's no ground uh, transceiver, aircraft can communicate directly to each other if both of them have ADS-B out. Free weather, and it includes these things. Uh, NEXRAD, which is basically radar, uh, METARs, TAPS, Air med segments, convective segments, no cams, pyreps, special use airspace, wind block, temperature block, and TFRs. Um, if you compare that to what you get off of XM weather, it's not exactly the same. There are a few extra things, but it's pretty darn close. When uh, XM weather, what's their source in the radar? Uh, natural, the, all of this is natural weather service. So you're getting the same product. Sort of, yeah, sort of. All of them get National Weather Service as their uh, source, but they all massage it one way or the other, and then they all um, transmit it at a certain granularity. The granularity of ADSB is slightly grainier than what you see from XM. And uh, the other difference with XM versus uh, ADSB next ride, ADSB, I'm sorry. XM weather, when you get radar, it's the same resolution across the entire United States. When you get radar, next ride radar from uh, ADSB, it's broken into two pieces. It's called local, I think they actually call it continental, not national. I think that's the way it's termed. But you get local and uh, national radar. The local radar is high resolution but it's only 250 miles around you. So you see a nice, crisp radar display for 250 miles. Now, if you're flying a 747, 250 miles only half an hour out, and that might not be the best thing. But if you're flying into the aircraft that I'll bet everybody in this room flies, 250 miles is at least an hour in advance. And it's not like you're blind beyond 250 miles. You still do have the national radar. The national radar is still as accurate. It's just not as granular. It's a lot more digitized, a lot blockier. So I can still see what's going on in Boston right here. But it just won't be, it'll be a lot more pixelated. Same kind of time delays? Yes, very similar time delays to XM. That's correct. What is the time delay? Well, um, at least in my setup, 
it actually dis and, and same thing with XM. It tells you what the time delay is, and it's typically in the one to ten minute range. But the time delay that you see, whether we're talking about XM or ADSB, the time delay stamp that you see is from the last transmission. But that does not include the processing time on the ground from when the image was pulled together in a mosaic. So whatever timestamp you see on your display, you ought to add a few minutes to that as well. Also, I don't think those transmissions are complete. I think there are many transmissions. When you get time related to the last transmission received, much of the data that we have is older than that. That could certainly be, yes. That's certainly what I see with that now. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. The, the uh, Sporties uh, webinar this the typical time delays for, for different services that uh, run over many take longer to account for than the other one of the two. Yes, that, that's correct. Yeah, they, they put up the exact the, the well, what they would put up would be the maximum delay. <coughs> but uh, having flown with it I will say the typical timestamp delay is less than five minutes. And then whatever timestamp you see you know that there's some processing time of a couple minutes in addition. It could be that much, yeah. yeah. But the bottom line, though, is while 10 minutes is certainly not real time, none of us flying single engine piston or even piston twins should be attempting to use this kind of data to penetrate a line of thunderstorms. That's not what this is all about. This is about finding either very benign weather that you're willing to fly through or staying wildly away from really bad weather. And really bad weather, you shouldn't be within 10 minutes of really bad weather. So if there's a delay, you shouldn't be at that close. Uh, the uh, FAA has come out with an advisory circular, that's the number, uh, saying that they are in the near midterm future, I think is really what they're saying, that ADSB is going to be updated and they will have uh, lightning icing, turbulence, and cloud tops, which covers now like 95% of what you would get from XF. So uh, today it's probably 80, 85% of what you would get from XM, and generally very similar to identical products, and sometime in the near future additional products to get it really close to what you would get from XM. And so for my money, and I'm one of the all-time cheapskates, I think this is the deal of the century. Free weather that's pretty darn good and going to improve. Okay, portable units. We've got the GDL 39 here and Stratus are the two most popular ones. Uh, both of those have a first generation, second generation. The first generations are around four or five hundred bucks. Second generations are eight, nine hundred, a thousand bucks, something like that. They are in devices only. They are received only. None of the portable devices now, none of the portable devices in the future will transmit the position. They are in only, receive only. Okay. And they, all of them, require a tablet to display. In just a minute, I'm going to pull it up here and show you what that looks like. <coughs> the traffic is limited. That's what we were talking about before. I'm here. I stimulate the, the, the ground receiver because I'm transmitting my position. That ground receiver is very nice to me and sends back all the traffic within 25 miles of me. But that GDL 39, 15 miles over there, sees my traffic, thinks he sees everything, and he only sees the traffic around me and thinks there's nobody near him, but there is other traffic that's not being broadcast to him. Is it because of trying to figure out uh, the multiple no, it, it's, the FAA carrot and, it's the FAA carrot and stick. They don't want to transmit more data because they want you to transmit the out position before 2020. So they're only giving traffic to the out people, hoping to encourage more people to transmit the out data. In the case of that guy that was up there, though, and he's getting your information, but there's another guy the other side of him, equal distance the other side from where you are. Is he not going to be getting his too? Yeah, he'll be getting mine. And he'll be getting that guy. And if there are enough of them around him, he'll get the whole picture. He'll get the whole picture. Okay, 
That's what had me uh, confused because before, okay. Yeah. Right. So if there are enough guys, yes, he does get the whole picture. But if there's only one guy, he only right. gets a part of the picture. So and maybe, what's that? All you guys should buy it out. That's right. <laughs> so in the meantime, just to begin, if you do get an air to air, you'll get the other guys. You won't get your own. Say that again. If you have just an in only, and you receive an air to air, the guy that has an out, you receive that traffic, you'll get his occupants, his area, and you won't get yours. Correct. Absolutely. You could be tricked into thinking you're displaying all traffic, and you are not. And there's no indication, when you look at the display, and we'll see this here in just a second, when you look at the display, there's no indication of which of the aircraft in there is the one stimulating the transmission. So is it 25 miles around this guy, or 25 miles around this guy, or 25 miles around this guy? You don't really know. If there's enough aircraft, you can kind of guess it's somebody in the middle. But other than seeing enough aircraft in guessing. There's no way to tell where the center of a 25 mile zone is. All right, let's see if we can get this to work here. Hopefully the battery hasn't run out on any of this stuff. We've got, it says I've got six aircraft being displayed. If you could hit that light switch, please. Okay. see that um, up there, but I can see it now. When I first powered it up, it said it was tracking six targets, and right now it says it's only it's tracking zero targets. Okay, bottom line note is I'm getting a good signal from a ground station. There's only one ground station, and let's see if I do this. <coughs> Maybe if you turn the iPad brightness. Yeah. Well, this is where we are right here, and the antenna is being depicted, and it's right there. The antenna's right up on the hill there. Well, you could turn the light on, but turn the iPad brightness down, I think. Uh, okay, who knows how to, well. Right. You're going to get the reflection yeah. from the ceiling, uh, which is that light right there. Well, let me, let me see if I can. Uh, is there a brightness under the tools menu? Okay. Well, I want to try something. Uh, it may not be worth doing at all if we don't have any traffic. Let me take a look here again. And you never know when the traffic's going to pop up. Yeah, exactly. That's the problem still tracking zero targets, so there's no traffic. Let's see if um, we can do this. Okay, good, yeah, all right. Um, ooh, that's even better over there. Ooh, look at that. All right, so it's a little bit hard to see because of the uh, contrast and everything. This is uh, kind of Kansas area. This is what the pixelated weather looks like. This is the national, what I think they call continental weather. And it, uh, there's no guarantee that that plane has ADS-B or somebody else is stimulating it, right? Um, so this, let me take a look exactly where this is. Where is this? Um, yeah, it's Kansas, is exactly right. 
this is uh, the Denver area up here. So this is just east of Denver. So this is ADSB weather, and I'm able to see out into the Great Plains here with ADSB weather. This is not within 250 miles, so it's somewhat pixelated, right? But I can see, you know, okay, help me here. Is that red? Yeah. Hey, I can see red here, so I'm not going anywhere near that stuff. And once I do get a little bit closer, I'll be into the regional weather, and it will, instead of being so pixelated, it'll become very, very detailed. Well, maybe not very, very, but it'll become detailed, and I'll be able to say whether I really want to get close to that or not. Will you be able to see the red better in the... No. <laughs> Not the regional one doesn't help me at all. <laughs> all right, now, I don't think... Yeah, see, there's nothing in California. This is, again, this is Reed Hillview. Uh, Reed Hillview right here. Uh, and there's no weather in California, so I, if, if we had some storms moving through right now, I could show you what the local weather uh, radar looks like, but I can't do that. Right. That's where I was headed next. Version of. So, notice what it says right here, FISB. That means ADSB, tra ADSB weather. Read Hillview, 290, I can't read it there. Let's see if I can sharpen this up here at all. That's, believe me, I can read it fine down here. 290 at 6, ceiling. Unlimited temperature 70, dew point 57, visibility 10, altimeter 29 or 9 or 9 or, sky clear. And then if I go over to San Jose. It doesn't give you the name of the weather though, does no, it? No, and that's the same thing you get with XM. It, yeah. In fact, it gives you the weather and nothing more. So if there's a NOTAM, runway 3 or 1 right closed, doesn't have that kind so of So it's not a native. No, none of them. No matter how you're getting this data, <clears throat> none of them are natives. They want you to listen. Yes, they do. <laughs> so you're still stuck listening to the natives. Huh? You probably should, yes. Yeah, I don't know a little more value if you can't hear it. Uh, yeah. Okay, and so here what I've got, this is, now, again, this is uh, from ADSB. This is a uh, terminal forecast that I just brought up from um, San Jose. We hope he doesn't have a terminal, but here's a terminal forecast for San Jose. This is all from ADSB, and I'm picking it up off of the GDL 39 right there from the transmitter on the hill over there. Were you surprised to find out that you could receive inside the room? Yes, I, in fact, I did this last week. I brought that in here, and I said, I wonder if I'm going to be able to do this during the presentation. It's like, wow, even in the building, you can get it. Yeah. Um, Let's see. There we go. Okay. Yes, yeah, good. This shows up here. This is the King Fire. This is a TFR being transmitted by ADSB. Right? If I click on the King Fire, notice it says TFR right there. We have, I can pull up the information on that TFR, and it says hazard firefighting, and then that text that you need a microscope to read tells you all the details about where it is and what it is and all that kind of stuff. And uh, here it says, surface 8,000 to provide a safe environment for firefighting aviation operations pursuant to blah, 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 blah. It's telling me the location and what that TFR is, all from ADSB. Uh, I don't know. Uh, 
special use airspace is information that's transmitted, so you could query it, but you're asking colors of a colorblind person. <laughs> so I don't really know if it changes colors or not. Um, another one. Find this. Here we go. There we go. Give it a minute to refresh. Here's winds aloft. At the moment, I've got it selected at 18,000 feet, but I've got my wind bars, right? So here's 20 knots, 15 knots, 10 knots, 10 knots. But I can see my wind vectors. And one of the nice things you can do with this. slide it up and down and see the barbs change with intensity and direction with altitude. So I'm scrolling through the <coughs> altitudes here, kind of pick my best altitude for the winds. Where's the intensity? The barb itself, it may be hard to see from the back, but for example, this one has two little feathers on it. This has one and a half, two feathers is 20 knots, one and a half is 15. A little hard to see, but it's there. Well, just like I learned. What's the software you're running on the iPad? Is that the Garmin? Pilot? Yeah, that's the Garmin. It's called Garmin Pilot. Pilot. Yeah. Question on that more specifically. Is this software or other packages pulled in like flight planning so that you can do that? So this Garmin Pilot, yes, this, yes. Pa this package does. There's no guarantee that some other package also does. Each package is its own package and does its own features. But for example, for Garmin Pilot and Forflight are the two most popular ones, and they're very similar in functionality. And yeah, they do all the flight planning and submission of flight plans and all that kind of stuff. Using the real-time data. Using the real-time data. Yes. Okay. Is that a uh, is that a Garmin? That's a, GD, a Garmin GDL thirty nine. Okay, and I think Forflight only works with Stratus. Garmin only works with Stratus. I'm sorry. Four flight only works with Stratus. Garmin Pilot only works with the GDL 39. Right? Put traffic down. Okay, let's take a look and see if traffic's. Uh, if I've got some traffic. Yes. Not connected. I somehow I've lost connectivity. The lights are still correct. Well, at least we're outside the final approach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure why I've lost connectivity, but I have. But it has downloaded the data to here, so I don't know what has it. Oh, it just got it back. It looks like it just came back. Uh, and it's a little hard to see, but there's, oh, this is my power cord <laughs> in the image. But, uh, just now saying that it's starting to pick up the data. Let me see if I. Uh, it's still not there. Let's see. Is that Wi Fi or Bluetooth? Bluetooth. Somehow it lost sync with that device. It's plenty close enough. And the, the blue light on here, how about that? I can see colors of blue light. We'll connect to this. Uh, uh, did it just show up? Yep. There we go. Thank you. Okay, tracking one target. There it is, oh, several targets. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So, uh, this aircraft is at uh, 21,500 feet. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but there is a arrow here pointing up. That means he's climbing and his tail number, in this case, it's an airline flight, and it just disappeared, but it was his uh, airline flight number rather than his end number. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We're working on wind.
consume carbs. We could also display temperatures. Right, so the, uh, looks like it's losing sync with the device. So here we are at 21,000 feet and minus 15 degrees, minus 13 degrees, minus 16 degrees. We bring it down to more reasonable altitude. 9,000 feet. 9 degrees, 11 degrees, 9 degrees. All of this data is coming across from, a, from ADSB, from that antenna over there. Right? So all those products that I was telling you about earlier, whether it's NEXRAD or METAR or TAFs or temperatures or winds, this is how you would see it displayed. Right? You could see it displayed with a portable unit like this, the traffic is misleading. We saw that one aircraft there, and it seemed like that was the only one around. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. We just don't know is the problem. Okay, we got somebody, oh, look at that. There's a ton of aircraft. All of a sudden, just magically appeared. Okay, let's see if I can find somebody with a tail number showing here. Uh, I see a couple of airline flights there. It's United Airlines 724. Like that guy said for SFO. VRD, I don't know who, what airline VRD would be. Virgin, maybe? Um, Lucid Sync, they're coming and going. But multiple aircraft. Bottom line, though, is as you can see, if you're able to, I'm having some problems tonight that I don't typically have. And certainly, if you have it, if you would turn the lights back on. Uh, if you have it installed in your plane, um, If you have it installed in your plane, uh, I don't ever have dropout like that, right? So all of those products, winds, temperature, METARs, half traffic, are coming from that ground-based transceiver. The weather is coming 100% of the time. The traffic is coming only when an aircraft stimulates it. And it stimulates it for 25 miles around itself. You've had a 39 for a long time. Yes. You decided to put ADSB out into your airplane and you wanted high altitude and outside of the US, so you got GTX 330. Yes. Why did you also get a GDL ADA? Because the 330ES is out only. I needed some in device. 39. Yes, but I wanted it up on my installed display. Yeah, you but could. If you, if you were willing to settle for having it on your iPad, then that would have been just fine. Yeah, and then talking to a lot of people, uh, a lot of people said I had too much money and I was willing to do it. On my built-in display in my plane, rather than on an iPad. Oh, you wanted to just to look at the picture built in. Yes. Okay. Rather than on an iPad. Right. Ken, if, if anyone would like to play with an ADSB in the unit, we've got a second generation Stratus uh, on the line at Great Wind, and it integrates automatically to full play. Right. So you have to plug the thing in. Right. Yep. And we have the first generation, 39. So if you're using Fort Flight, we have that device. If you're using uh, Garmin Pilot, we have this device that you can play with at Great Wind. So, uh, the Garmin Pilot, that's like 150 bucks, and you have to renew that every month. So all of these applications for the iPad have an annual subscription. The prices are all very similar. They start out somewhere in the 50 to 75 bucks a year subscription, and they all go up to somewhere about 150, 200 bucks a year, depending on what features you purchase. So it's somewhere between 100 to 150 a year every year. Oh, so the fourth four flight, uh, you have to purchase that one. All Every year. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the free. You have to purchase a subscription for the... Uh, so the charts. Charts. Yeah. yeah. Just have to update the charts every year, and that's what it does. For yeah, me. but it's all the charts, so yeah. it yeah. doesn't do you much good without the charts. Of course. <laughs> right. of course. So I think, I think that's, that's all on the price. price. Yeah. All the weather and whatnot, unless you purchase the charts, it doesn't have anything to do. Uh, Garmin well, actually, if you buy it and you get your subscription with the charts, and you don't renew the charts, it doesn't go away. It's just your charts oh. are all updated. Oh, okay. You, you get the charts every time. You're paying because you're having moving map on the chart. 
before I ask my question, you have a lot more yeah, to stuff to that's what you present. Or you don't have to it up. This yeah, is the last slide. <laughs> You're the cheapest Go ahead. in town. Yeah. I was curious on a couple things. The first was the uh, sport class aircraft. You think initially, I, initially I thought, well, they'll probably all just go with the low, the FL 180. Uh, the 978 units. Right. However, they can't fly into Class C or Class B or uh, Air Force anyway. So why would they buy anything? So it seems like that would be kind of a big hole is unless you have ground-based radar picking them up, you're not going to pick them up. Well, well most of the ground-based radar is not disappearing in 2020. I understand. But still, you like you, where you might want this the most is, well, you need it in a congested area, of course, but if you're out in the middle of Nevada, like you said, you kind of like to know where these guys are, but you won't be able to know. They won't be re required to have them. That's correct. They won't be required. But yeah, I understand that uh, it would well, be, we'll say, nice to have. It would be nice. I agree. Yep. Will the military have it? That's a good question. I have no clue what the mandate is for the military. Don't know. I've heard that there is some kind of incentive program where you can... No, we did talk about that only briefly. Um, at the moment, there's no incentive of any sort at all. There has been talk about various incentives uh, none of which have yet been implemented. The most recent one that I heard not very long ago was uh, that they were going to have uh, low interest rate loans uh, to help you buy the equipment and get it installed. But that is a proposal, not a fact. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I heard from another owner who claims to be taking advantage of that. So, I okay. seriously okay. doubt it. Okay. Uh, unless maybe you know a dealer might have done something for him. Uh, but the, the proposal is a federal proposal, but it's only a proposal in the very beginning stages. Does that mean that all of these products are like STC'd or something into old aircraft? Because you have a lot of... Yeah, they're all STC'd in, yes. Okay. Just blanket STC'd into... The well, it's, I believe the term is AML, approved master list. So it's STC AML. Uh, and it basically says, yeah, all these aircraft can have it. So you'd have to check that. Yeah, yeah but unless you're flying a Grumman Widgeon or something like that, uh, it's <laughs> unlikely that you would not be included. Okay. The, the, the approved master list will include any normal aircraft. Going back to the history of when this was first being introduced, I remember reading in the Alpha pilot, you know, the various debates and they were starting out in and I believe there was some debate about what we were and we're not going to be getting, and obviously one of those was ABSD in. So what sort of things are we not getting that they discussed earlier that were on the table previously? Do you know? I'm not aware of anything that was proposed five years ago that does not exist today. Right. I think again, I think pretty much all of it is there. And you don't again you don't know anything about whether Canada or the rest of the world can get, come on board with uh, Basically, our 978 ADS-D. As far as I know, and I'm pretty sure this is correct, there's no proposal outside the United States for ADSB in. The United States is the only one who's doing that and is proposing. Nobody else is proposing that. So we're lucky that we're getting this free traffic and weather because nobody else is, nobody else is proposing it. I would have guessed that the satellites are the gigahertz, not megahertz, but not sure. Something sticks in my mind about transponders, normal transponders. The transponders you have in all aircraft today are 1090. Yeah. Well, that, but that's, I would but there was something that pulse with modulated signal. Well, there was something to do with satellites, and I don't know. I don't remember all the details, but yeah. don't know. Okay. I, I don't think the, the satellites are using. Pulse with modulation for, for intelligence on them. Could be. I, think, uh, I don't know. 
All right, so I do have a couple of additional sources here. Uh, the advisory circular that I have up there, uh, I mentioned it earlier, it talks about what some of the additional weather products will be, but it also talks a lot about ADSB in general. If you look at the AIM, AIM uh, 4 5, 7 through 10 has a pretty good description of the whole system. Some of that gets a little too technical and you have to read it five times to really get what they're saying, but it's there. Uh, and then Garmin uh, online has what they call the uh, ADSB Academy at that website uh, listed right there. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not similar, but it's got a lot of the same sort of things as I've been discussing here. So if you forget something or you're not quite sure how it works, you can go to that and they'll talk about some of it as well. And then it says, but you should go see your dealer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> buy our stuff. <laughs> Special deal. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Thank you Ken. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Hey, Ann. <laughs> so a question for you all. Who's your primary traffic in device? <laughs> I know the answer to that. <laughs> right here. <laughs>